Before moving on to James 3.9, Denlinger claims that Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father is the separation of body and soul, and uses Revelation 6.9 as an example of this separation. Now, I'm going to give you the best way to destroy Trinitarianism and modalism. You can destroy both heresies with one simple argument. Go to the book of James. Very easy. You can get into all the debate. Well, what did it mean when Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father? You know, well, that's a separation between body and soul, just like the saints in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, that they're saying there's their souls under the altar, and they're saying how long you know, until you avenge our blood on the, on the earth. They're talking about their physical blood that was shed down on the earth, and yet their soul's in heaven. There's separation there. That's all that it means. Jesus Christ has some prophecies that he needs to fulfill and whatever else, and so there's separation between the body, Jesus, and the Father, the soul, there. It's very easy if you just understand Scripture. It's not two separate persons. That's heresy, because there's no Scripture for that. In the verse in Revelation, granting his understanding of the text, this state of the saints is post-martyrdom. This separation is death. Why is this not the case in God? Dellinger just asserts that it's not, but we don't get a good reason. How can the essential parts of God separate and this not be a change in God? If the Godhead is what it is by the integration of the three parts, how can it still be that with the disintegration of them? If you take a car engine apart and put all the pieces in the pile, do you still have an engine? This is contrary to right reason and scripture. Wilhelmus Abraco quickly covers the issue of Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father in The Christian's Reasonable Service, Volume 1. So I'll excerpt his comments here from pages 647 through 649. Let us first of all consider its veracity. The session at the right hand of God is frequently confirmed in God's word. This was promised in the Old Testament. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, in Psalm 110.1. Acts 2.34 and Hebrews 1.13 confirm that this is said concerning Christ. In the New Testament, it is stated that this has actually occurred. He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, Mark 16.9, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, Colossians 3.1, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1.3. This is a figure of speech, for God is a spirit and has nothing in common with a body nor with anything resembling it. Thus, God has no right hand, but it is a figure of speech derived from human language. Men are generally strongest in their right hand, and primarily carry out their tasks with this hand. Therefore, God's right hand is symbolic of strength and powerful execution. And the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, Psalm 80.15, the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, Matthew 26.64. Since men consider their right hand to be the most worthy, they will place those whom they wish to honor at their right hand. Solomon did this with his mother in 1 Kings 2.19. Therefore, Christ's session at the right hand of God conveys that he is exalted to the highest degree of glory. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1.3, on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, Hebrews 8.1. In view of this, Christ is said to be crowned with glory and honor, Hebrews 2.9. The sitting at the right hand is not indicative of superiority over him at whose right hand one is, for the bride, the church of Christ, is also presented as standing at Christ's right hand. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir, Psalm 45, 9. Nevertheless, she is and remains subordinate to Christ, such is also the case here. It only conveys the supreme glory of Christ, and thus it is without any reference to the glory of the Father in regard to greater or lesser. Without controversy, God is and remains the Most High, and no one can be above Him. It is senseless to imagine His having a right, middle, and left hand. The sitting, standing, and being at God's right hand are indicative of the very greatest glory which can be bestowed upon a creature. To this glory, only the Mediator, Christ, according to His human nature, has been exalted far above the holy angels. Concerning this, the Apostle states, but to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand? Hebrews 1.13 It is something different when God is said to be at someone's right hand, that is, when one may experience his mighty help, and it is another thing to be at God's right hand, which is indicative of the highest honor and glory, and thus properly belongs to Christ alone. Believers are indeed promised that they will sit with Christ upon his throne, Revelation 3.21, 
which refers to the communication of his benefits and glory which Christ has merited for them in his humiliation and exaltation. However, they are never said to sit at the right hand of God. The Lord Jesus, as mediator, sat down at the right hand of the Father. According to his Godhead, he is coessential with the Father and eternally co-equal with him. So in this respect, he cannot receive more glory. His session at the right hand reveals, however, that he, the mediator, is the only glorious God, a fact which in his humiliation he nearly always concealed behind his humanity. He refers to this when he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 17, 5. In his human nature, he is glorified far beyond our comprehension, and the measure of light, love, and enjoyment of God he receives according to his soul are the ultimate of what a creature can absorb. In his bodily glory, he excels all who are round about him. Paul, speaking of this, says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Philippians 3.21 But uh, I'll show you the quickest way to destroy any Trinitarian or any modalist. Right here it is, James chapter 3, verse 9. There, therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. We aren't little gods like some of the charismaniac nuts teach, but we are made after the similitude of God. We are similar to how God is made up. What is God? God is the body, Jesus Christ. You're looking, when they, people looked at him, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And I'll be showing you lots more scriptures to tie into this. They're looking at Jesus Christ. They're seeing God manifest in the flesh. There he is. He's standing there. He's God. Inside of him, he has a soul that's eternal, that cannot be harmed, that's greater than the physical body in the sense of it's not going to feel the pain and everything of dying on the cross. Body, Jesus. Soul, the, the Father, God the Father. And the Spirit is the Holy Ghost. It's simple. Man is made after the similitude of God. God is three in one. These three are one. You see, man is three in one. Enlinger says that James 3.9 is the definitive verse to disprove Trinitarianism and modalism. Men are made after the similitude of God. This is very true. What does that mean? If you work backwards as Brian does and read man's composition back into God, you will create a God in man's image and with man's creaturely limitations and dependencies. This point is really foundational, and getting it wrong can have catastrophic consequences, as we see here. Man's being is contingent in part due to being composed of parts. If God is composed of parts, God is contingent. God is clearly independent in us say, therefore he cannot be made up of parts. Since that is the case, after the similitude of God does not mean what Denlinger wants it to, and thus this verse does nothing to disprove Trinitarianism. Also notice that here, his understanding of after the similitude of God is based upon God having a body, soul, and spirit. Elsewhere, the basis of his claim that God has a body, soul, and spirit lies in man's composition in the same manner and his being made in the image of God. Now, the proof that after the similitude of God is referring to composition seems to be the fact that both God and man have a body, soul, and spirit. It's a never-ending Assyrian stairway proofing system. But in reality, there is no true grounding for his claims, and those clinging to them will fall to their calamity. Three separate things there, or parts, or whatever. Well, the word parts, that doesn't say three parts in the Bible. Okay, use your brain. <laughs> All right, common sense here, folks. What is a body, a soul, and a spirit? Well, it's not technically a part. You would have to say a thing, or perhaps a, you know, or you can just be simple and say, parts. It's the three parts of man. Not that difficult. Now, Dellinger says that man is three parts, but in answer to his interlocutor's charge that scripture doesn't call them parts, he exhorts us to use our brains and common sense. He then engages in some philosophical reasoning to show why calling them parts is acceptable. The very sort of thing he chides Trinitarians for doing. My point is not to say he shouldn't be doing this, but that the hypocrisy he does what he says others should not do, shows his inability to be consistent. If he condemns those who say God is three persons for adding to Scripture, he has added to Scripture for calling them parts.